Hi all, welcome to day 19 of Advent of Elixir. Today I'm going to show you the Q module, which comes with Erlang OTP distribution. It's a pretty common data structure problem to construct something called an amortized O1Q data structure out of linked lists. Uh, for example, I know that App Academy taught their boot campers how to do this. And in fact, uh, I was taught how to do this by one of uh, junior programmers that I hired from App Academy. So quickly, let's define what a queue is. Um, it's an ordered list of items where you can access or modify data on either end. And by modify, I mean either adding a new item to the end or removing an item to the end. So that could be either the front or the end. And for queues, what I'll do is I'll talk about them using front and end description. Now, the most common use case is to think of a queue as like a shopping market line or queuing at, at a bank or something like that, where there's a front and an end and you add new customers or objects to the end of the line, and then you remove them from the front. Now, the Erlang Q module will let you do both operations from both sides, and I will show you that. Um, but in the beginning, let's just talk about how the data structure works in the normal uh, mode, where you're putting things into the end and taking them from the front. So, to distinguish this from just a normal linked list, which is what a list is in Erlang and Elixir, um, in order to make modifications to the far end or to find out what the value is at the far end of the link of the list, it's an expensive process. That's why we don't like to use operators like plus plus because if the lists are really long, it can uh, it can be a little bit tricky to, um, to use this because it'll incur a very long uh, amount of time to, to run through that. And so the idea is that most of the time with a queue data structure, it's fast to do those sorts of uh, manipulations. Um, so the nice thing is that the solution to this problem is pretty easy to, to describe. And um, Erlang gives you out of the box with the queue module. So uh, instead of describing the solution, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use the Q module to show you what the solution looks like. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to spin up a virtual machine. And the first function that I'm going to show you is Q.new, which will create an empty Q. I'm going to assign that to the variable Q. And so interestingly, what you can see is that this is a tuple with two lists inside of it. Okay, so let's uh, start by adding items to the queue. The function that will add an item to the queue is the queue.in function. Uh, note that this might cause you some issues if uh, you ever try to implement a function in Elixir with in, because in is a keyword uh, that's defined in the kernel module. So what we're going to do is we're going to do queue. in, and then I'm going to add the item 1 into the queue and pass Q as the second, uh, second parameter. Now, it is important to keep in note that since Q is an Erlang function, it doesn't really necessarily follow the Elixir standard of having your data type be the first parameter in a function. So in this case, we see that the Q goes in the second position instead of the first position, which is what you might expect in Elixir. All right, so let's go ahead and add one in. And note that what has happened is that we've put one into the left-hand list and we keep the right-hand list, the empty list. All right. So we're gonna now add two into the list or into the Q. And so what we see is that two got put into the left-hand side and one got moved over to the right-hand side. Now we're gonna add three in, and four in, and five in. Let's also do six. And from here on, you can see that what has happened is that we're just, we're just appending 
that new value into the front of this first list and keeping the second list the same. So what's important about this is that this is a uh, O1 process because it doesn't depend on how many items are in the queue. We're just going to keep putting items into the back of this queue. So now what we're going to do is we're going to withdraw values from the queue. And so what that means is that we're going to take items from whatever represents the front of the queue. Now the front of the queue was one. So what we're going to see is this, uh, this list is going to get modified. We're going to remove the one from this list and then something else is going to happen to the, to the queue. So the queue.out function takes a, just the queue parameter. It doesn't need anything else. But what it's going to do is it's going to re return some sort of value that indicates the popped value from the queue and also the, uh, the, um, the new queue that, gets, uh, that, that results from this. Now remember that Erlang is a functional immutable programming language. So you know, I can presumably go back to any of these previous values and obtain them. Uh, and they still exist uh, in sort of without having been mutated by these q.in and q.out functions. Do be careful though, there are some modules in the Erlang OTP distribution, for example, Digraph, which is a directed graph uh, solution that uses a mutable data structure under the hood. Um, uh, in the case of Digraph, it's an ETS table. And the reason why they like to do that is because for certain algorithms like Dijkstra's A star algorithm, um, you just simply can't do it effectively with an immutable data structure. So you must have mutation to do certain things uh, extremely well. Okay, so let's actually watch this queue out uh, function operate. And what you can see is it's returned this tuple with the atom value and one, which was the uh, item that was popped out of the queue. And then what it's gone and do done is it's reversed the beginning of this, <coughs> excuse me, it's reversed the end of this first list and turn that into the second list and then it's left the last or the first two values of the first list. Okay <clears throat> so what is going on here is it's tried to go ahead and balance the two lists together. Um, so this is a roughly even number of items on either side and um, and now you can see that um, pulling uh, the next q.out function is going to have um, going to have this uh, two value be at o1 operation, which doesn't depend on the length of this list. It just can pull it from the front. So let's go ahead and do that, and we're going to see value two. We see three and four shrink, and then it's going to, if we do it again, we're going to get four, and that was also an o1 operation because it just pulled from the front. And then if we do it once more, we get five uh, because it pulled this one uh, out, which left nothing. And then so I had to rebalance the two lists. And then uh, getting five required us to rebalance the lists again. And so it moved it here, moved the six to the right-hand side. Then if we do uh, the last one, we're going to uh, result with the empty queue like we had at the very beginning and uh, value of six. And what happens if we try to queue out again? We get the atom empty. So now you can see why they bothered to prepend this value one, value two, value three, and so on and so forth, uh, because to draw the distinction from when you um, had uh, a, a true value in there or something empty, or it was trying to pull from an empty list, uh, you know, you might imagine that in Elixir we might use nil, but then the problem would be, what if you tried to put the nil atom itself inside of the queue? How would you be able to distinguish between that being in the queue versus that being the negative response of the queue dot out? Another thing is you might have expected them to have designed this to be okay error. So okay value when it has something in it, an error that it doesn't. But I guess the designers of this um, module decided that Having trying to pull a value out of an empty queue had a different feel from being an error, and so they decided to just call it empty instead of error and value instead of okay. All right, so that's how this works. So one important thing to note that it is not always O1, right? And I believe that on average it's O of log n, but I could be wrong about this. 
Um, and, uh, and it's just called O1 Amortized because most of the time it's going to try and make it so that as, as often as possible, getting a value out of this system is going to be an O1 operation, but I can't guarantee that it will be every time. Okay, so I told you that there were also reverse operations available. So let's go ahead and steal this one, number six. So let's do Q equals V6. And then what I'm going to now do is I'm going to add to the, add to the front end instead of the back end. What you would imagine that would do is adding to the front end would add to the front of this second list because then if you try to remove it, the tip of that of this list uh, or the left hand side of this list is an, is an O1 operation, which is what it should be because it's the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and do Q dot in R, which is in reverse. So the reverse of the in. There's also an out R, which will do the exact opposite operation that I'll show you in a second. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add in, and I'll go ahead and make this the A atom. And so you can see the A atom, like I described, is placed at the front of this uh, of this second list. And let's go ahead and add the B one, and let's also add the C one. So we basically uh, N Q at the front of the shopping cart line. Uh, a shopping cart customer, we put, put a few customers in front of everybody else. That's what the in underscore r function does. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate that, of course, that the out uh, will do what we expect. And so we managed to get the c value out of this q. And then b, a, and 1 are, are the remaining items at the front of the q which is what we would expect. And if we did out R, we're going to pull from the end. And so the last item in the list is this number five. So let's go ahead and pull that. And you can see we got five. And then here we have four, three, two, and B, A, one, which is exactly what we expect. Okay, so the Q module, there is one more thing to note about the Q module. And what I'm going to show you is what happens when you try and uh, compete, uh, complete, tab complete this Q module. You're going to see a few weird function names like cons and snock. So cons is adding an item to the front of the list. So it's the, it's the same as in R. So to show that to you, I'm just going to do Q dot in R. So we're going to put C into back into the Q, but instead of using in R, we're going to use cons. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what snock is. And snock is a probably too cleverly named uh, function name, which is the reverse of cons. See, S N O C is the same as S N O C. Uh, and so we're going to put five back at the end, and you'll just see snock in operation. Uh, oops. There we go. Uh, and not only is it backwards, but the, but the parameters are in backwards, which is possibly a little bit aggravating. And similarly, there is a tail function uh, which will, let's do that. Which will, um, which will, uh, remove, um, the first item, doesn't give it to you, um, and then, and then show you what the tail of that list is, which is what you might expect if you treated it as if it were an Erlang tail, um, function, TL. Um, and then to kind of prove to you that this is like a uh, poorly designed, uh, you would expect the, um, the function name to be liat, uh, because that is the backwards of tail to remove that five. But there's also a late function, which is just an artifact, which does exactly the same thing, but it's just an artifact because when they initially designed this API, they uh, misspelled the backwards tail uh, and made it late. 
So, you know, I think it's possible that they were being a little too clever. But um, to be fair, these uh, function names are are described in a very old paper um, where they talk about how to construct this um, Q data structure in a functional programming lang language setting. Okay, so those are the basics of the Q module. I will drop a link to the Erlang documentation on the Q module. Note that there's also a third um, API for uh, for how to deal with queues. So I, if you know, if you want to do anything a little bit more complicated than what I've shown you, I strongly recommend that you read through the documentation before proceeding and decide for yourself which of these APIs um, you want to use. Uh, which one will make for the easiest to understand code because you don't want somebody to read uh, your code down the line and kind of be look over with a glazed eyes not understanding exactly what's going on. Okay, great. Um, hope that helped you. Uh, know that you have one of these data structures already built into the Erlang uh, virtual machine uh, modules for you. Okay, bye. See you tomorrow.